Hey folks, Dylan here. How's everybody doing out there? So this week, uh, this is something a little different, because while you folks have been watching the, uh, the last two installments of uh, my little series about text encodings, uh, I've been busy. I've been in Denmark, I've been at the Copenhagen Developers Festival, I uh, took a weekend off, went to Hamburg, did a little sightseeing, went to Minute Wonderland there, which is just awesome and the coolest place you've ever seen, and you absolutely got to check it out. And uh, folks, if anyone thinks, oh, it's just, so Minute Wonderland is like this warehouse full of like miniature cities and miniature racing tracks and miniature volcanoes, and the level of sophistication there is just amazing. And if you're thinking like, oh, we'll take a quick look, it'll only take half an hour, no, no, if, if you're into like, model building, if you're into little dioramas, if you're into any kind of control plane automation or anything to do with digital circuitry or magnetic impulses, or you just want to watch little model airplanes land and take off at a genuine model airfield, like you need half a day for this. Honestly, I'm going to go back. It's going to be awesome. But anyway, I got back from that. I had a whole bunch of stuff on this week. So uh, yeah, I, I kind of, <laughs> I didn't have anything in the bag to go this week. And then uh, I thought, well, well, hang on. There's been some really, really interesting stuff. So it's thank you, thank you to all the folks who have watched the uh, sort of last six, seven videos all about the history of text encoding and ASCII and Unicode and all that kind of stuff and uh, have left comments on it because there's actually been a lot of really, really good stuff in there. Now, I don't know if you folks uh, know about Ward Cunningham, who uh, invented the wiki and built the first wiki software way back in 1995. Um, now, he, he apparently didn't actually say this, but, or he, like, it's not, he, he didn't publish it. He mentioned it to somebody and it became known as Cunningham's Law. The best way to get the right answer on the internet is not to ask a question, it's to post the wrong answer. And, you know, this is kind of true. Like, I've noticed a lot of times if you go on, I don't know, a site like Stack Overflow and you ask a question, you won't get a great deal of traction. But if you find an answer which is 100% wrong and incorrect, um, people love kind of, uh, you know, demonstrating, no, no, that, that's not, I know a better way or I know a different solution or that's just, just wrong. I don't know what that says about human nature, but it certainly makes for a really kind of, you know, interesting feedback process. So what I've done for this week is I've put together just a bunch of comments on things that, things either I didn't know or things that I just plain got wrong. So yeah, my bad, somebody was wrong on the internet, it was me. And uh, so one of the things that I said when we're talking about, you know, text uh, uppercasing and lowercase, and we're talking about things like the Turkish dotted and the dotless I, and uh, somebody dropped in in the comments and they said, uh, you know, isn't that incorrect? for Greek and I dug this up. Yeah, I had no idea. The Greek letter sigma has three different versions. There's a capital sigma, but then there's like a lowercase sigma if it's at the beginning of a word, I think, and then it uses a different lowercase if it appears elsewhere in a word. And uh, yeah, so this was a couple of days ago and I, I stuck a reply on it kind of half jokingly. I'm gonna need to make another video about all the things I learned from the comments. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more I thought actually that's not a bad idea, you know. So uh, the other thing that I, I completely got wrong in uh, talking about the S set, the German Sharp S, um, I said that it's only used in Germany and it's not used in Switzerland or Liechtenstein. And uh, apologies to the people of the great country of Austria. For whatever reason, the source that I was getting that from, which was probably Wikipedia, did not mention Austria and so neither did I. But uh, yeah, it's used in Austria. And I'm sorry, I've been to Austria. I was in Vienna for an event uh, years ago. Well, a couple of years ago now. It was great. I had a fantastic time there. Austria is an awesome country. And yes, they use the S set. And as uh, Coda 1337 says in the comment, it's also used by German speaking Italians in the, the, the Sudtirol region. And so, yeah, there are countries all over the world where they have German speakers who use the sharp S. So, uh, my bad. Sorry, Austria. I didn't mean to, to mess that one up. Now, Another thing, now this was just one of those those fluffs you make, uh, it turns out, so I said that uh, the S set was introduced in 20, uh, the, the German Orthography Council introduced it 2017 and Unicode added it a year later. I just misread the year. Unicode added it in 2008 and the German Council for Orthography, they caught up nine years after that. So Unicode was actually way ahead of the curve on that one in having the, the capital S set, which, you know, as I mentioned in the video, it was already being used on signage and sign writers and some typesetters kind of had their own variations. There just wasn't an official one. And so Unicode got there first and then the, the standards about it, they were brought on nine years after that. Now, uh, <laughs> No mention of byte order markers when talking about LE versus BE, little endian versus B endian. Now, you know, the way that I 
put these kinds of videos together. Certainly, certainly this one. Uh, this, these series of videos came out of a, a talk that I've done, which has had various incarnations and evolved as I've given it and people have told me things and shared stories. And most of the stuff in that talk came from kind of stuff that had happened to me and, you know, direct personal experience or stories that I'd had. And, you know, I sort of knew about bite water markers, but honestly, they never really come up. Like in my, my career as a developer, so a bite order marker is, uh, it's a little thing. It is a zero width non-breaking space. So to all intents and purposes, this is a completely invisible character that can be the, uh, what's called a magic number. So it appears at the start of a text stream. And the idea is that it tells any software which way round the ends work and also signals, hey, you're reading a Unicode file with a big endian or a little endian and uh, which, which Unicode character encoding this thing. Uh, yeah, and it's optional. You know, it doesn't have to be there. And this is something you know, I, I've never, I've never had to explicitly work with it. I've never written code that had to account for a byte order mark, and I don't think I've ever found a bug in software that I could attribute to a byte order mark. So I just kind of, you know, coasted along blissfully ignorant. But then I was looking this up, and I realized I have seen it a couple of times. If you've ever opened a source code file, and there's been this kind of little weird gibberish characters at the beginning, this this little thing here, um, that's a byte order mark. And what that actually is, is it's the byte order mark in UTF-8, but the file has been opened using the Windows 1252 Western European code page. Now, I've probably seen this, I don't know, maybe a hundred times in my career, but all I've ever done is just delete it and save the file and then everything just works. So I kind of never really stopped to think very much about, about where this came from because it was so trivially easy to fix. But yeah, you go and look it up on Wikipedia and this is what the, the byte order mark looks like in all these different forms of Unicode. And sure enough, you know, there it is, byte interpreted Windows 1252, it's the, the eye with a diuresis and then the right angle quote and then a Spanish upside down uh, opening question mark, opening question mark quote. So uh, <laughs> yeah, byte order marks, that's what they are. And yeah, I absolutely, they should, any series on text encoding probably absolutely should have included acknowledgement and some discussion of byte order marks. Um, but yeah, it's something I, I kind of, I got to this point and it just never really came up. So uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay, so uh, Ukrainian license plates. Now, uh, I got a couple of really interesting comments about this. So uh, a couple of folks said, uh, you know, we've gone full Latin since 2020. And there are letters like D and J and Y and Z, which are not part of the Ukrainian Cyrillic alphabet, which are being used on uh, license plates. And I had another comment from someone, yeah, Ukraine mentioned. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there are Latin letters on uh, and they're used for special codings and things. So I, I did a little digging and I couldn't kind of find a sort of problem with researching any of this kind of stuff uh, online is I don't read or speak Ukrainian. Like I can, I can work my way around the alphabet. I can read a restaurant menu, um, but I'm by no means conversant in the language. So I'm looking for English language resources and I couldn't find anything about what happened in 2020, but I did find this, which is from 2023. So this is last year, um, about banning certain letters which have associations with the, you know, the, the Russian military and what's happening there. And so I'm guessing that if the government banned Z and V in 2023, then yeah, they probably must have introduced them at some point because they aren't in the, the pike match box encoding that I talk about, which was, was introduced in the 90s. Um, so yeah, if anyone has, a, you know, sources or more information about what's happening with, uh, with those things, I'd love to hear about it. Just, you know, it's so interesting to me that you think, all right, we got to write a database of car registration plates. And you think, you know, how complicated is that going to get? And then you realize that there is way more to it than, uh, you know, you, you could possibly have anticipated. Uh, so when I was talking about UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32, uh, one of the things I mentioned with UTF-8 is that it only goes up to uh, four bytes in the current version of the encoding standard. Um, and I said uh, that was for compatibility with UTF-32, which of course, if you think about it for one second, is not true because UTF-4 bytes gives you 32 bits, but in uh, UTF-8, a lot of those are the byte markers. They're overhead because you lose the 1110 and then 101010 and the original UTF-8 spec allowed up to six bytes of data. And that meant that you could store 31 bits and UTF-32 gave you 31 bits of, of information as well. So yeah, it's not the four, four byte restriction is nothing to do with UTF-32, it's for UTF-16 compatibility. Thank you to No Longer Breathed In for, for picking that one up. Now this one, 
obviously not a, a serious comment, but I really like this. So this is CS233. Uh, it was when they hit the 257th symbol that all the compilation complications started. It's all the fault of the Unicode people. They should just have picked 256 symbols and told the world they all had to change their languages to conform to those symbols. Life would have been so much simpler, smiling face. <laughs> now, the reason why I want to talk about this is one thing that I have found time and time again when you know I'm traveling around and talking to people from uh, you know cultures and languages and, and backgrounds where the, the ASCII alphabet, the ASCII character set isn't you know what they, they use there traditionally, is they figured out ways to make it work. Uh, I was in Jordan a couple of months ago, I was at a conference out there and uh, I did a, a, this talk um, and a bunch of folks came up and said, do you know about a thing called Arabizi? And I'm like, what's Arabizi? And Arabizi was uh, a way of writing Arabic using SMS text messages which at the time, you know, in the sort of 90s, early 2000s, this was kind of locked down to basic ASCII characters. So you had a basically 127 char 128 characters of 7-bit ASCII. And so folks uh, worked out how to read and write Arabic using ASCII, which I just think, and it's not just like, you know, phonetics. They come up with things like sometimes they'd use uh, numerals to stand for Arabic characters which have similar shape and this kind of thing. Now, I, you know, I'm not even close to understanding Arabic well enough to be any kind of authority on this, but yeah, go and check it out. And there's a thing, I think it's called Romanji, which is a similar system in, uh, in Japanese. They came up with a way of writing the Japanese language using ASCII characters. So this comment, you know, is a, it, it's a, I guess a sort of humorous observation on the complexity of trying to support all these languages and cultures. But actually an awful lot of people out there, they kind of met the ASCII people halfway. They're like, all right, we get it. This, if the computers, if this is all we get, we'll figure out a way of, of kind of reducing our language so we can use this stuff to communicate. And the KOI8 encoding that I, I talked about in one of the videos, yeah, that's a, uh, you know, it's not intentionally ASCII, but it was designed with ASCII in mind. So if you lost your, your parity bit or whatever, you still get something which is, is seven bit readable. Um, so yeah, a lot of interesting stuff. You ever, uh, you go anywhere where they use an interesting language or alphabet, ask them how they sent text messages in the nineties. And they will almost certainly, there will have been some kind of unofficial standard for how to reduce the language they use down to seven bit ASCII and, and back again in the other direction. Um, so, uh, Oops, hang on, we talked about that one already. PowerPoint slides is hard, yo. So the biggest one, the one that got the most people going, no, 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 was about Control-D. So in the earlier, the first video in the series, I was talking about the ASCII character set. And uh, I said, Control-D isn't really used anymore. And a lot of people went, yes, it is. Control-D is used on Linux. It's how you get out of a shell and it's how you get out of the, the read eval print loop in Python and it's end of transmission and it's used all over the place. And I was like, is it? Because, you know, I've been building software since the 80s and building software professionally since the 90s. And for me, like, I mean, so one of the comments on this was, of course, Control-D, the keyboard shortcut. That's not Control-D, the ASCII character. Because I use Control-D every day, because in uh, Photoshop and After Effects and that kind of thing, it's deselect all. If you want to deselect all the things on your Adobe applications artboard, Control-D deselects them. And it's used in all kinds of things. But Control-D as an ASCII character, kind of, I never come across. And so I went on to, uh, to the, the social network formerly known as Twitter, because I was curious. And I said, you know, um, in my latest video, I said nobody uses Control-D anymore and, and uh, got some comments on it. Uh, am I doing it wrong? And yeah, so 42% of the people, so I had about 194 replies to this, and it was kind of almost like a 50-50 split. So 42% of people don't use Control-D. Now, I think this is a Windows thing because although I've worked on all kinds of systems, you know, I ran a Mac as my main system for a couple of years, and uh, I deploy everything on Linux these days just because it's a wonderful cloud server operating system, I still use Windows. For most of my career, Windows has been my desktop environment. And uh, Windows, kind of the things that control these useful for, they seem to me to be Linux things and Python things. And I've not spent a lot of time with Python, and I've not spent a lot of time doing Linux on the desktop. And uh, yeah, so uh, this is kind of one of those weird splits. There's people out there who just use Control-D all day, every day, and you know, of course it's useful. We can't write programs without it. And there's a bunch of other people going, yeah, uh, no, Control-D, what's that? So yeah, interesting. I'd, I'd love to see, you know, drop in the comments. Do you use Control-D or not? And if you do, or if you don't, uh, what's your stack? What do you work on? What's your kind of day-to-day -day working technology setup look like? And then the last one, 
which I'm going to end on just because uh, it's something of an interesting open question, was uh, Grey Wolf saying, you know, I've seen this in one of your recorded talks, and I like how you're slowly making each topic in this format. I wonder if you'll keep up your weekly schedule once your years of backlog runs out. Uh, Grey Wolf, I wonder this as well. Um, so I kind of set myself a target of doing one of these a week for, uh, I was going to go to 100. Because I think 100 is a good number. If you really want to know if something's successful or not, uh, I think you've got to do it 100 times. And uh, there's a thing, Sturgeon's Law, from the Golden Age of Science Fiction. Um, somebody said, uh, I think the question, somebody said, would, would you agree that 90% of science fiction is crap? And he said, yeah, but 90% of everything is crap. Which means that if you want a good one, you've got to do 10. And if you want a really good one, you've got to do 100 so that 90% of them are crap. And then you've got 10 good ones. And 90% of those are still a bit crap. And you get one one kind of really stand out that tells you you know how good this is and it, like if you're in a band and you're playing shows don't write it off till you've done a hundred shows that kind of thing and uh so yeah <laughs> so partly i do have a whole bunch of talks in there which i'm thinking about how i break those down into little series i got a whole bunch of new ideas for stuff but also i'm going to mix it up a little bit because uh, the format for this series has been scripted you know every one of them i kind of break it down and uh I've been doing, you know, write, figure out what you want to say, how you're going to explain it. There's a kind of production exercise. It got to a point it's taking about four or five hours to make a 10 minute video. This video is live. This is just me. I'm in OBS. I'm talking to the camera and going through. I made some, some PowerPoint slides with some screenshots. So this is kind of a, a much easier format to turn around. But then, you know, over the years, I got a bunch of other stuff I've done. Like uh, I got a, some music videos. My band, Line Breakers, the, the parody technology rock and roll band, we got a bunch of shows coming up in, in the autumn and we're going to have new videos for that. And I'm thinking maybe some weeks the, the Monday afternoon drop will be a new uh, Line Breakers, like the visualization that the videos we play on stage behind us. Um, other weeks it's going to be scripted stuff. Other weeks it'll be, you know, little bits like this. Some weeks it, it might be live. I'm going to meet a lot of interesting people over the next couple of months and um, maybe grab some of them, record a little interview. So uh, yeah, I don't... <laughs> I don't think it's realistic that you're going to get, you know, 10, 15 minutes of scripted content with the visualizations and the animation and all that kind of stuff, just because there are weeks when that takes more time than I have available. But I'm going to try to do something. I'm going to try and keep the cadence going. And like I said, we'll get to uh, 100 episodes. And uh, after that, we'll uh, figure out whether it's working or not and, and what maybe I want to do different. But uh, yeah, folks, as I said at the beginning, thank you so much everyone who's contributed, everyone who's watched the videos, everyone who's liked the videos, but everyone who's left little comments, you know. This is just a, a cherry-picked selection. There's so much great stuff in the comments and the commentary on all those kinds of videos. And, uh, you know, I had one comment from someone who's like, oh, I worked in the office next to the, one of the people who worked on ASCII. And it's those kinds of things makes you realize that for everything that gets written down, everything that gets put on Wikipedia or published in a GitHub repo, there are just so many amazing stories out there that you're never going to find unless you go out and find the people and go, hey, what did you do? What were you working on when that happened? Um, so I'm going to keep doing that. We're going to see how it works out. In the meantime, folks, hey, thanks for watching. Um, it's been fun. And uh, you'll take it easy out there. You have a good week. You look after each other, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.